My name is Susan Zesch. I'm the executive director of the Posen Family Center for Human Rights. And I am here to welcome you on behalf of the Posen Center. In a minute, we will get an official welcome from International House as well. A venue that we have used for this lecture series for the, is it 11 or 12 years that we've been doing it? The Kirshner Lecture Series is named after Robert H. Kirshner, who was a founding faculty member of what was then the Human Rights Program. Bob played a very important role in the diagnosis and investigation of torture around the world. He was part of the original group that the United Nations pulled together to draft the Istanbul Protocols, which provides for the medical diagnosis of torture. I'm proud to say that another generation of University of Chicago Human Rights Center is now involved in that since um, in the last couple of years, Dr. Rohini Har, who is a graduate of both the college and the medical school here, has been called into the international group of experts who are revising the Istanbul Protocols because Bob Kirshner is no longer with us. Rohini is extremely proud to be stepping into her teacher's shoes, and we are very proud of Rohini for carrying through the presence of the University of Chicago Human Rights Center into this important international work. I want to thank everyone who worked to put this program together. Um, we have a fabulous staff, Ashley Pierce, Michael Fisher, Kathy Scott, who do all of the difficult logistics work in coordination with the IHOUSE staff to make this a very smooth running production. Um, we, I wanted to just say one word about how happy we are to welcome Alice Kim into the Posen Center family and her brilliant directorship of the Human Rights Lab which is part of what you will see when we're getting into the later parts of the program. Um, I want to say just one thing about Albert Wood Fox, because a lot of people are going to say a lot of things about him. To me, he represents the resilience of the human spirit, that he is the warm, open person that he is after as many years as he suffered unjustly in solitary confinement is really a tribute to his inner strength, to the support of people who loved him, and to his, I think, stubborn determination that he wanted to see justice done in his case. We are honored to have him here. <laughs> One word of explanation. Some of you may be wondering, it's not June. Why is there a Kirshner lecture? Why am I here? And we decided last year, along with the Kirshner family, and I wanted to thank Dr. Barbara Kirshner, Benji Kirshner, Dan Kirshner, the rest of the Kirshners who are, as usual, sitting in the front row and supporting us, for agreeing with us that the primary focus of this lecture should be the student body and the community. We switched it from June because that was finals week and we mostly had an audience of alumni and community and now you can look around you and see, I think we're close to 400 people here tonight to participate in this program. So our program is going to be introduced. First, Denise Jorgens will welcome us on behalf of International House, and then Professor Reuben Miller is going to introduce the panel. Um, I'll do the Reuben Miller's introduction so Denise doesn't have to worry about it. Um, we just, we are getting to have a close relationship with Professor Miller. He was the moderator last week at our Smart Talk, The Problem with Police lecture in the Smart Museum. And it's partly because of his work, also because of his open and generous nature that he's willing to come out and do these events. Um, but his work is about the impact of mass incarceration on communities. He examines life at the intersections of race, poverty, crime control, and social welfare policy. And we are waiting for his book, which we hear, hear is finished and now just has to get published, which is called Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration. So I'm going to cede to Denise Jorgens to welcome us all to this beautiful building once again. And then Reuben Miller will come up and introduce Albert Woodfox and Alice Kim. Thank you.
Good evening and welcome. Let me add my, my words of welcome to International House and to the University of Chicago and to this evening's program. My name is Denise Jorgens and I'm the director of International House. The mission of International House and International Houses Worldwide, which is currently a network of 20 houses on four continents, is to enable students and scholars from around the world to live and learn together in a diverse community that builds lifelong qualities of leadership, respect, and friendship. We achieve this mission by daily interaction among our students and scholars through internationally focused public programs such as this evening's event, through our unique facilities and community life activities designed to foster diversity of thought and experience. This evening's program is one of over 200 held at International House as a part of our Global Voices Performing Arts and Lecture Series. Whether it's a music or dance performance, a film festival or a cultural celebration, a lecture, conference or symposium, International House presents cross-cultural <clears throat> presents programs that advance cross-cultural understanding and promote civic discourse on community, national, and world affairs. As a part of our Global Voices program series, we are so pleased to collaborate again with uh, the Center for Human Rights on the Robert H. Kirshner, MD, Human Rights Memorial Lecture. We've been involved with this program since the beginning, and it's really one of the highlights of the academic year. And I echo Susan's remarks about including so many students tonight. We invite you to join us here at International House throughout the year for many of our other programs and information is available in the entryway. On behalf of our global community, I wanna welcome you again and thank you for coming. And now I invite <coughs> Ruben Miller to begin this evening's program. Thank you. So I, like you, am very excited um, that we've got Mr. Woodfox here, um, who I think um, just represents a quiet and powerful uh, uh, spirit, uh, a generous spirit. Uh, resilience is, is an important word. Power is, 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 is another. Um, so thank you for coming out this evening. And it's my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce our distinguished guest, Albert Woodfox. Um, Mr. Woodfox will be joining conversation with our own Alice Kim, the director of the Human Rights Practice Lab here at the Posen Center. To tell you a bit about Professor Kim, she's a writer, a teacher, and an organizer whose work addresses issues around access to education for people who are incarcerated, capital punishment, police torture, and the prison system. Uh, she was a 2016 Soros Fellow, a co-founder of the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials, this is the group that initiated historic reparations legislation passed by the city of Chicago, the uh, Chicago City Council in May of 2015 for survivors tortured by Chicago Police Commander John Burgess torture ring. She was a leader in the movement to end capital punishment in Illinois and nationwide and worked closely with the Death Row 10, a group of African American men who were tortured by John Burgess forces and sentenced to death. She's also the co-editor of the Long Term Resisting Life Sentences, Working Toward Freedom, and is co-authoring a book now on Chicago police torture cases, and we're very fortunate to have her here. She will join our distinguished guest, Mr. Albert Woodfox, who needs no introduction, but whom I'm honored to introduce. Mr. Woodfox was born in 1947 in New Orleans. Uh, he's a former political prisoner and human rights act, uh, advocate who served 43 years in solitary confinement for a crime he did not commit. His sentence served in a six foot by nine cell at Louisiana's uh, infamous Angola prison is the longest solitary confinement ever endured in the United States. After decades of activism and many legal appeals, uh, Mr. Woodfox was released from prison in February of 2016. His memoir, Solitary, Unbroken by Four Decades in Solitary Confinement, My Story of Transformation and Hope, was published last spring by Grove Atlantic to wide acclaim. 
Solitary has been named the New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice, a top 10 book of the year by Publishers Weekly, and last month was named as a nonfiction finalist for the National Book Award. A committed activist and Black Panther Party member in prison, Albert remains so today, speaking about the inhumanity of solitary confinement to a wide range of audiences, including the Innocence Project and the National Lawyers Guild, as well as at Amnesty International events in London, Paris, Denmark, Sweden, and Belgium, uh, and he lives in New Orleans. That Albert Woodfox survives his time inside is in and of itself a feat of extraordinary endurance against the violence and deprivation he faced daily. That he was able to emerge a uh, whole from his odyssey within America's prisons and judicial systems is a triumph of the human spirit and makes his book a clarion call to reform the inhumanity of solitary confinement in the U.S. and around the world. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Alfred, Alfred Woodfox, Albert Woodfox. <laughs> Good evening. So we're, thr we're so thrilled to have you here with us, Albert. I want to welcome you to Chicago. Um, I hope you think of Chicago as a second home where you have people who love, admire, and care for you. Um, before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge uh, some people who have also returned home and are now actively building communities communities of care across prison walls who are here with us, Anthony Holmes, Greg Banks, Ali Hammonds, Kilroy Watkins, Monica Cosby, Eric Blackman, Melvin Jordan. Thank you so much for being here with us. So it's been such an honor for me to get to know you over the last few years since you came home from Angola. And now that I've read your book, um, which is such a gift to the world, um, I am even more in awe of all um, that you have endured and survived. And as you say on the cover of your book, uh, that even in the face of inhuman and barbaric conditions of solitary confinement, um, that you came home to us unbroken. Uh, but more than that, you've also maintained a commitment uh, to building a more humane and just world. So thank you for being here with us. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, I'd like to thank the staff of the University of Chicago for, you know, inviting me and to thank all of the wonderful people who have come here to uh, join us in this conversation, you know. Okay, so... I wanted to actually start off by asking you to talk about your mother. Um, you begin and end your memoir with your mother, um, and your book opens with this beautiful poem um, that you wrote for your mom. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you to tell us about Ruby Edwards, the woman who we're so grateful to uh, because she brought you into the world. Well, my mom, you know, uh, there was a time when I really had no appreciation of the, the human being or the woman she was. Uh, like, you know, most young teenagers, uh, we get to a certain age where we think we know it all, you know. And all the wisdom and, and, and the love and comfort that our parents have given us no longer matters. Uh, and uh, you know, my mom was uh, functionally illiterate. Mm -hmm. And for most of my life, she was a single parent, and but at the time I didn't realize it because I was too busy being, you know, uh, this rebellious teenager to realize the, you know, the very foundation that would one day uh, allow me to become, you know, the human being I am to to, to make that transition from a petty criminal into a. a, a part of humanity and a political activist. And, uh, you know, my mom uh, was the inspiration of the Palm Echoes, you know. And I can't imagine, well, I can't imagine in a way, but the pain that she went through, what it took for her to, you know, uh, 
provide food and shelter and, 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 and care for us. Uh, and in my most darkest moments, uh, I could always remember the image of her, no matter what she went through, what she endured, they never broke her spirit. Mm -hmm. They never made her doubt her self or it as a human being. And uh, she was determined, you know, whenever she set out to do something, she was determined to accomplish it, and no matter what the cost. So these were the, the, the principles and, and the values that, uh, you know, I had to grow into, mm -hmm. you know. It took me a while uh, to, you know, uh, develop enough self-education and enough wisdom to uh, appreciate, right. you know, that my mom was my first hero, you know. Um, in your book, you describe how your mom tried to protect you from going to jail and would warn you um, about um, hustling in the streets, right? Um, and when you were a teenager, everyone called you Fox. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you and your friends started calling yourselves uh, the Sixth Ward High Steppers. High yeah, yeah. So can you tell us about um, that time in your life? Well, you know, uh, like, as I said, like most, most teenagers, mm -hmm. uh, I was rebellious as far as, you know, the guidance and, and the love and care my mother was, was providing. And uh, in hindsight, I realized that a lot of the options I thought I had, mm -hmm. I never had. You know, uh, I lived in a country in which the institutions were racist, the individuals were racist, and the systemic application of racism, how it affected my life. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I think the question I've, I've been asked the most is what would I change in my life mm -hmm. if I could change anything? And it, it wasn't, a, you know, a difficult question to answer, and that was absolutely nothing, you know. But all I've been through in the last, say, 50 years, the pain, the suffering, the isolation, the solitary confinement, uh, uh, you know, the awakening, the development of a, a political level of consciousness, a commitment to humanity and to social struggle, you know, uh, all of these things were born out of the pain and suffering of being, you know, in prison. And so it allowed me to ask myself some difficult and hard questions and to try to develop, you know, values and moral principles that would allow me to uh, rise above being, just being a petty criminal and a prisoner. Mm -hmm. You said when... Um you were out on the streets and you were with your friends and you were trying to figure out ways to get things that you didn't have, that you didn't think of this as um, committing crimes, right? You th it, was, it was something different to you. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I re you know, I, I refer to it as the guilt, guilt of innocence. Uh, yes. You know, uh, you know when, you, when you're trying to survive and, you know, you're preying upon the very people in your community, uh, you never think the, the, the consequences are to that person individually or their extended family. You know, you never, you never uh, uh, think about this. You know, you're just surviving. You know, anyone who has had to survive, you know, uh, really never give any deep thought to the harm they're doing, you know, to the community thing. And that was one of my, when I realized that I was finally gonna, you know, be free, uh, I had two worries. Mm -hmm. uh, I was worried how would it affect my family? Would they accept me back in the family? And how would my community uh, react to my, you know, uh, becoming a part of the community again? Uh, I'm happy to say that on both issues, you know, I, I think I did pretty well, you know, I've uh, uh, 
managed to, uh, I have, you know, beautiful daughter, uh, grandkids and great grandkids. And, you know, and I work tirelessly with community organizations and stuff, trying to uh, uh, deal with the day-to-day issues that affect their lives. And, and as well as to challenge the powers that be in, in the state of Louisiana and America and around the world that, uh, uh, you know, don't really care that much about humanity. Okay, so you shared this photo with me the last time you were here in Chicago. Um, and it's a photo from the early 1970s, um, you said, when you were in Angola. And so Angola is known, um, you know, notorious prison. It's the largest maximum security prison in the U.S. Agriculture. Yeah. It's an agricultural prison, yeah. yeah. Um, and you said that this photo was taken for um, a magazine that... Um, uh, people who are locked up in Angola still produce today. It's called yeah. the Angolite, right? Angolite. Can you it's talk about those? award winning uh, magazine. Uh, a guy that, who was in CCR for a uh, uh, you know, number of years uh, finally got out and uh, was uh, you know, a writer for the Angolite. Mm -hmm. And he came up with the uh, idea of uh, doing a story on guys uh, who were in CCR, which is solitary, you're in a cell for uh, 23 hours out of day, a nine by six cell. And so he had this idea of trying to, you know, put a face to these men who, no matter what they did, they, were, they weren't going to get out of solitary. And I think the name of the article was The Planet, you know, like you plant a tree or something, you know. We had been planted in solitary confinement, and you know we weren't going to get out, no matter what, you know. And so they came up, and he had a guy with him was taking pictures. So that's, you know, how that picture came about. You know, we I was doing an interview with him about what it was like to be in solitary confinement so long, and how had solitary confinement changed since. You know, uh, when I was first put in there on April 18, uh, uh, 1972, uh, I was falsely accused of a security officer had been murdered. And because of my political activism uh, in the prison and organizing against, you know, uh, corruption and brutality and, and sex slave rings uh, that were going on, you know, uh, I be all, when, when Mr. Miller was found dead, I became the primary suspect, and I was the first one they locked up for investigation. Right. And 44 years and 10 months later, you know, I was finally uh, released from uh, solitary, you know. Okay, you've said that you have had um, the Black Panther Party was really responsible for your political awakening. Um, that, uh, and it was, I think, when you were in uh, the tombs in New York where you met um, three members of the Black Panther Party yeah. and that they were really responsible for um, helping to educate you and, and really responsible for you taking your first steps into a different way of life, what you described, the organizing that you did um, inside against the conditions, um, even uh, uh, forming an anti-rape squad um, in the prison. But can you go back to um, those days in the tombs and that political awakening that you experienced um, and how that came about? Well, at the time, I was running from a 50-year prison sentence uh, for armed robbery. Uh, had I been, you know, a young white kid my age, I probably would have got two or three years or something like it there. But because of the institutional racism and uh, uh, particularly the judges, you know, uh, sitting on the bench at the time, I was given a 50-year sentence. and. Uh, instinctively, you know, I did what every slave has a right to do, and that is to escape. And so I escaped, and eventually I wound up in Harlem. Uh, prior to that, you know, I had a peripheral awareness of the Black Panther Party. Who didn't? I mean, the party exploded 
uh, on American uh, scene in uh, in the 1960s, and uh, but I still was just another petty criminal, mm -hmm. another knucklehead, you know. And uh, so, you know, when I escaped and wound up in Harlem, uh, this was a different Harlem from the Harlem I had seen before when I was there to, to try to uh, buy drugs or, you know, some other type of contraband. And, uh, you know, they had the, uh, the Panthers was a, a physical force in, in the communities in Harlem. And they were, uh, you know, uh, Escorting senior citizens, helping them, you know, make groceries and stuff, uh, clean up the neighborhood campaigns and political awareness, raising political awareness, and you know, trying to instill, you know, uh, uh, in the people in the community a sense of pride and self-respect and a sense of self-worth. And uh, you know, but <laughs> being a knucklehead, you know. Uh, my interest at that time was the beautiful women, the sisters that was in the party. And uh, so you can imagine this this 22-year-old knucklehead thinking he's the smartest person in the world approaching these, these women and, and uh, talking street smack, you know, and these women talking about revolution and social struggle. <laughs> and taking control of the community, you know, and so, you know, I'm like, yeah, uh -huh, all right, yeah, 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 you know. <laughs> I had no idea what they was talking about at that time, you know. But, uh, uh, you know, and then eventually I was arrested and uh, wound up in the tombs. And uh, at that time, they had, they had an incident called the Panther 21, in which the uh, Black Panther Party office had been attacked by the New York Police Department and forced to defend themselves. And uh, so three, it was four guys from that, those 21 was put on a tier I was on. And when they came on a tier, you know, in prison, when you come on a tier, if you're not well known, you automatically become a victim. And everyone is, is looking for weaknesses in which they can exploit and, and, and take advantage. But these men came on tier talking about unity and social struggle and black uh, awareness and black pride and, you know, making themselves available to, you know, any guy, guy that couldn't read or write, writing letters for them, you know, uh, showing them how to navigate that they all wore uh, more honorable way to navigate prison than 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 you know usually the uh, uh, the predatory uh, nature of prison, and uh, they used to hold every day. They used to hold for about an hour. They would hold political classes, you know, in which they would talk about uh, the struggles that were going on in America, the economic, political uh, conditions, how they affected African Americans' lives. And, but, you know, while I was, you know, listening to what they were saying, I wasn't hearing what they were saying. And a, a guy came down and he had a book called A Different Drummer. And, uh, you know, he, I don't know, maybe he noticed something in me or he seen a potential or something. And uh, he, you know, he said, yeah, I want you to read this book and tell me what you think of it, you know. And it was the first book I ever read from cover to cover. And that book was really the first step and to me sitting here tonight having this conversation with you and the audience. Uh, because the one thing it did is it made me uh, realize that one person couldn't make a difference. They just had to be willing to, to sacrifice and compromise and ch make changes in, in, their, in themselves first and then in the, the people around them. And so from that point on, you know, I started hearing what the Panther Brothers was, was saying, you know, not just listening to it, but hearing it and begin to understand, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, the term we use, develop a level of consciousness, where I became aware that I was not a criminal, I wasn't born a criminal, criminality was not in me. That the economic and political and social forces in America had determined 
that I would turn out the way I turn out. And so, you know, that was my first step towards uh, transformation and change within myself. And then you, you, eventually to try to change other, other men. And then you met Herman Bell and Robert King when you Herman were in Wallace. Angola. Oh, sorry, yeah. Herman Wallace and Robert King when you were at Angola. And the three of you forged an incredible and really special friendship and camaraderie. You three became a force. Um, as I mentioned before, you uh, organized against the conditions of solitary confinement. You learned the law together. Um, you stood by one another. Um, and you also did something really incredible, um, formed anti-rape squads in, in prison. Um, can you talk about um, some of that organizing that you did together and how the three of you forged this friendship when essentially you were also taken apart. Um, you weren't allowed to be on the same tier in solitary um, confinement. You no, were we, we weren't even allowed to meet with our attorneys. Eventually the attorneys went to court and got a court order. But you know, we had this saying, you know, separated but never apart, never touching but always connected. And that personified our friendship, you know. Uh, just being friends with them gave me strength. It gave me a sense of, of, of self-confidence. It gave me the feeling that, you know, uh, no matter what I went through, I could always count on them to have my back. And it was that friendship that made everything I accomplished. Uh, as an individual and as a, a, a social activist, uh, I don't, I, you know, I hate to think what my life would have been or how it would have turned out had I not had that friendship. And uh, unfortunately, we lost Harmon mm -hmm. three days uh, after he won his freedom in 2013. He died from liver cancer mm -hmm. that was concealed from him by the prison uh, medical people. And, uh, you know, we, uh, well, it, it's strange because Robert wasn't even, wasn't even in Angola. He actually didn't come to Angola to after the Brent Miller uh, murders. Right. But because he, we knew each other and because he had joined the Black Panther Party along with Harmon and I, he was placed in solitary on the, for suspicion of a murder that he wasn't even in the prison when it when it occurred, you know, and but in prison population, Harmon and I was uh, we used the term raising the level of consciousness of the prisoners by teaching them that the way they were being treated it violated their human rights, and it also violated you know the constitutional rights and other legal rights that they were entitled to. They just had to have uh, the strength and determination to demand these rights. And and so, you know, we organized against, uh, you know, prison corruption. Uh, uh, there was an active prison uh, sex slave market going on in which young men, at that time, they were placing young men as young as 16 in state prison. And I remember one night in my dormitory, they had this little kid sitting across from me. He must have been about 17. And it was the first time that I became aware of a spirit that had been broken. And I eventually, by talking with him, I realized that he had been forcibly raped by four other guys. And he was talking about, you know, killing himself and stuff like it did, you know. And it really bothered me, you know. And, I, you know, I just couldn't find peace within myself. And, you know, I berated myself. I'm like, how can you, you know, you say you revolutionary and you're an activist and all, and you allow this and, you know, to go on and you don't do nothing. So the next day I went down and I talked to Harmon. Uh, he was in another living unit uh, uh, about, you know, what I had witnessed and what it had awakened in me and what, what could we do about it. And we came to the, the, the determination that the only thing we could do 
would to offer physical protection for these young kids when when they came there's a day when you could come from uh processing into the prison to being placed into the actual population and it's called fresh fish day and so we started going down there and as soon as these young kids got off the bus we would approach them and we would introduce ourselves and we would talk to them about the history of slex slavery and what they expect and to come to us if they needed help and you know uh, by that time, we had established uh, the only branch uh, Black Panther Party recognized in a prison. And uh, so, you know, we had some, some influence, uh, some out of respect and some out of, you know, you don't want to mess with the Panthers, you know. And so we, uh, we were very success successful. And I'm sorry to say, after the Miller uh, killing, and they were locking up pretty much all the black prisoners. And, and uh, we had a comrade named uh, Irvin Brewer, and they called him life because he had a life sentence. He was killed trying to protect one of the kids, you know. And because he had no support, you know, most of all the members of the party had been locked up in cell blocks, and, 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 and so he, he didn't really have the kind of support that he had when before Miller and we were all, you know, in, in population together, you know. And so, you know, those are basically the thing, you know, clothing, food, I mean, uh, uh, we, we used to see like uh, every month the, these uh, tractor trailers would come in and they would have like chicken and ham and whatever, but you know, we would see uh, security people and administrative people leaving all day with boxes of meat on their shoulders, you know. And when it come time, you know, f to eat, you know, we were eating rotten ground meat and, 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 you know, everything but the type of meat that was supposed to go to the prison population. So we were organizing about that. We were organizing again about against not having adequate clothing, not having adequate work tools to do the brutalizing work that was necessary. And you know, uh, and the, you know, uh, Angola was uh, segregated at the time, so we started to try to uh, build a bridge between white and black prisoners, mm -hmm. and show them that we all had a common interest, a common uh, enemy. Uh, so those are the type of things you know we were actively involved in. Uh, you also used hunger strikes as a tactic, as a way to yeah. get the administration to pay attention. And you had one hunger strike that lasted many days. Um, 45 days. 35 yeah. days. 45. 45 days. Um, and can you share with, with everyone what that hunger strike was over? Well, the hunger strike started because they used to feed us uh, we were in nine by six cells, and they used to put our food on the floor and push it underneath the door. And uh, at some point in time, you know, what you accept as being normal, when your level of consciousness is raised and you're, uh, you become aware of how wrong this is, how immoral this is, how degrading this is to be forced to eat off the floor, uh, you face with making a decision, which, what, what, you know, I know this is wrong, so what now? What do I do now? So we, uh, we decided to petition the warden about, you know, cutting food slots uh, in the bars where they can hand us our tray in a humane way. And uh, after not getting any response, after about two or three weeks, uh, we said, well, you know, we just, we're not going to, you know, eat under the door anymore. And uh, of course, we never thought that, you know, this hunger strike would last. You know, we figured that two or three days, four days, five days, they would, you know, come and we would talk with them and show them why they should, you know, cut. And, but in 45 days, you know, and so some of the guys uh, start passing out from lack of food and stuff. and. Uh, so Robin and I, you know, we, since everyone 
looked up to us for leadership, we said we, we need to change this some kind of way. Mm-hmm. And so we, the administration wanted us to come off the hong strike because of the bad publicity they was get, getting from the newspapers and stuff in the state. And so uh, we said, you know, we will start eating again if you will cut the food slots. And they said, okay, but, and then we said, well, we're not gonna eat on the door. So, you know, we, if we can eat through the bars, they're like, well, we don't care how y'all eat, you know, as long as, you know. So that was how it started, you know. We, uh, we would stand at the bars and hold our tray in one hand and eat through the bars, and then eventually somebody come up with uh, you know, a little shelf made out of cardboard and strings, and then everybody start doing that. Uh, but the thing is, we ate like that for 18 months. Uh, we never had any idea this was gonna go that long, you know. So for 18 months, we ate through the bars. And the good side of it was, they started cutting food slots and all these cell blocks, you know, in the prison because everybody had to eat on the floor. Mm-hmm. And so they came to the building I was housed in. That was the very last building they come to. And they cut all the bars on all the other tiers. And when they come to the tier I was on, they cut all the cells except four. They said they ran out of materials there. But this was just a ploy. They were determined to make someone eat under the door. Because that, you know, that really was a, 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 a goal of theirs, to break us, to break our spirit, break, to break our determination, break our unity. And so, uh, to me and some other people, it was like the food slot they cut wasn't there. I continued to eat through the bars really as well as King and some of the other guys. And, you know, we want an impression like, all right, you ran out of materials today, so tomorrow you'll come and finish. And it was like a month later, they still hadn't cut the other four cells. And so, you know, uh, me and maybe about six or seven of us were still eating through the bars. And so they would, you know, come on a tear and they were like, you know, why are you not, you know, uh, and I'm like, well, when y'all cut the rest of the balls, we, we'll eat through, through the food slot, you know. Until then, you know, are we going to continue to eat like this? And so after about a month, uh, we gave them an ultimatum. You know, hunger strike is probably the most successful form of protest in the prison system. But it's also the most brutal because you're inflicting pain upon yourself by denying yourself food. And uh, at some point in time, your body starts to feed upon itself. And, uh, you know, by the time uh, this hunger strike lasted 45 days, and by the time we, you know, started eating, you know, we all looked at, like, I'm sure you've seen some of the pictures of the uh, concentration camps in World War II. Uh, That's how we looked, you know. Our bodies, virtually, was feeding on itself. And, uh, but the, the spirit and the determination and the strength of the men involved was, was, was unbelievable, you know. Uh, it really is um, unbelievable, and thank you for uh, providing that uh, source of, that, that example of solidarity um, and staying in it with one another. Um, uh, I, I teach at Stateville Prison, which is a maximum security prison uh, for men here in Illinois. I think one of my colleagues is here, Joe Hari, who also teaches um, at Stateville. Um, some of the men are organizing um, to win parole legislation um, here in Illinois. Illinois effectively doesn't have um, a parole system. and. I wanted to ask you what would be your advice um, to to those men as they continue to fight for for that and also for um, conditions, better conditions um, to learn within because they're all taking classes and there's 
there's an ongoing tension always um, that exists um, to be able to um, educate yourself. So uh, can you offer some words of advice? Well, usually, you know, when I autograph my book, I use the term, stay strong. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's very, it's not only, you know, it's a very deep felt principle of me. You know, it's something I learned uh, uh, in my experience of uh, 44 years of solitary confinement. And uh, they have to stay strong, they have to stay focused, and they have to believe in what they're doing. You know, I read a, a, a something uh, Nelson Mandela read once when he said, if a cause is noble, you can carry the weight of your, your uh, world on your shoulders. And I thought that uh, the fight for humanity, mm -hmm. the fight for to be treated in a humane way, uh, was a noble cause, so I was willing to make whatever sacrifice necessary. Um, I, I never had a breaking point. That didn't exist for me and a lot of other men. And you know, uh, one of the one of the things that really drives me to keep doing what I'm doing is that, for some reason, depending on whatever your belief is, we were chosen me, Harmon, and, and King, to be the voice of the men and women housed in prisons and hid in solitary confinement, and, and the children, and, 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 you know, so we are trying to, you know, long before we, we got out, you know, we made a solemn vow to each other that when we went free, not if, but when we went free, we would be that voice, and we would be put a face to the men and women hidden behind bars, uh, prison walls, and being, you know, brutalized and, and uh, you know, solitary confinement. You're confined to a nine by six cell for 23 hours out of the day. It is the most brutal, non-physical torture that you can inflict upon another human being. It has no redeeming value is so purpose is to break you to break you as a human being to to break your sense of self worth you to destroy your spirit you, you know and and so that is it's a tool uh, it, you know it, it should never be used and if you know so right now our goal is to gradually do away with the use of solitary confinement and so the struggle now is to put restrictions and stuff and to start a national debate i think we have been successful in starting a national and international debate on the brutality of solitary confinement and uh a lot of states have changed their policies to where you, you can only be put in solitary for certain uh, rule violations. And if you meet certain requirements, they have to let you out. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we continue to do that. Uh, you know. And that's why your book um, actually being shortlisted and then now being a finalist um, for the National Book Award um, is so amazing um, because it's being it's you're drawing so much more attention and awareness around the conditions of solitary um, confinement um, I wanted to ask you do you now that um, the book is out um, uh, is there anything that you wish you would have done differently in the book <laughs> well you know my life is so full of stories I wish I could have written about every experience. Uh, unfortunately, the book would have been three or four thousand pages long. And, <laughs> you know, one thing when, when we, when I first decided to write the book, uh, uh, the we, you know, we contacted the book agent, and she had me write a synopsis of what the book would be about. And so I did that, and then she sent these synopses around to different publications. And 12 publishing companies showed interest. And eventually, you know, uh, we went to New York and met with these uh, publishing companies. And, uh, and so a publishing company, Groove Atlantic, or Grove Atlantic, uh, 
made the biggest impression. Uh, the the uh, editor name is uh, George Gibson. Uh, he ex it was obvious that he went beyond the synopsis mm -hmm. and did his own research and and to you know the angle of the tree. And because in the conversations he would mention things that you know I knew right off that he had to do some research in order to know these things or to be able to ask these questions. So in the final analysis, you know, it, though that was the publishing company I chose to uh, publish my book. So you mention a few times in the book um, that there were some things that were really hard for you to think about um, and to write about. Um, how did you overcome uh, the obstacle, those obstacles? Well, the most difficult thing for me was the loss of my mother and my sister, both the cancer, and being denied the right to go to the funeral, you know, uh, to say that final goodbye, you know, the, to be able to say it from your heart and your soul, you know, I'm never gonna be able to hug you again or kiss you or laugh with you, you know, but I know you'll always be a part of me. And, it, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a real, very deep, principle in black families to be able to say that that final goodbye. And so they deny me that. Uh, I had to live with that burden, I'm never feeling as though I had somehow honored my mother the way, you know, I should have been allowed to. And then to lose my sister and have the same thing happen in defiance of a court order. You know, by that time, you know, we had established, I lost my sister in 2004 to breast cancer. And uh, we were extremely close, close out of all of my siblings. You know, she and I were, were extremely close. And so the, the attorneys actually got a, uh, a court order. And on the day that they were supposed to come, the Orleans Parish sheriffs were supposed to come get me. He said no. And they said, well, you got to, you know, the court order. He said, well, I'm not letting him go go to court. But he waited till after the courts had uh, closed to do this. So even if they had went by to the court and everything, by the time they would have worked this out, you know, it would have been too late anyhow. She had been, would have been buried. So I had to live with that. And, you know, when I got out, uh, I did a brief uh, interview with some reporters that was there and they want to know, you know, what thing. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to say goodbye to my mom. Mm -hmm. You know, I had lived with that burden for so long, that pain, that feeling of uh, being incomplete for so long, you know. And so uh, there was a file up in the paperwork, which they always, so I, it took about two hours longer than it should have for me to be released. So my brother, uh, you know, he, we got in his car and we drove to the cemetery. And that two hour lapse, the cemetery was closed. So I got out the car and I started to climb over the, the fence and my brother like, what are you doing? You know, I'm like, I'm going to say goodbye to mama, you know, He's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we just got out of prison, you know. We, <laughs> we can't do that there, you know. So, you, you know, he talked me down and because I was determined, you know, uh, you know, to say goodbye. And he said, look, let's go say goodbye to Violetta. My sister's name was, is Violetta. And he said, let's go say goodbye to Violetta and we'll come back tomorrow. And so that's what we did. We went to my sister's grave and I was able to say goodbye to her. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the next day, you know, we bought some store, almost every flower in the store. Mm -hmm. And we went, you know, to my mom's grave and uh, I was able to finally, you know, get that, that burden, you know, I can't tell you what it was like to just stand there. And, you know, my brothers, they, you know, say, look, you and mama talk, we're gonna stand over here. And, like, you know, we, and so to just stand there, it was like I could actually, mm -hmm. you know, feel her presence, you know, and, and, and finally, you know, say goodbye. Right. And so. so 
writing is an act of discovery, right? So what did you learn about yourself um, as you were writing um, the book? I think I learned that all the self-education and wisdom and all that, mm -hmm. uh, writing gave me an opportunity to use those, those qualities that I had developed. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it gave me an opportunity. My reason for wanting to write the book was to be able to me, me, uh, to make an impression on more people. Mm -hmm. I knew that no matter how, you know, Robert and I, who the other member of the uh, Angola Tree, you know, we do a lot of traveling uh, across America and, and, and outside of America talking about the issues, you know, not only just prison issues and solitary, but political issues and stuff. And no matter how many times I travel, and I travel a lot, I could, would never be able to reach as many people as a book would. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, I, you know, found someone who I thought would, you know, get out of me the things that I wanted to, but would do, be reluctant if it was just me mm -hmm. to help me with the book. And it took us about a year and something, you know. and. Uh, and then after that, it was like the editors, you know, well, you need to talk more about this, you need to do this, you need to take this and change it. And, but once we got all of, the, all of that, you know, in the book form and the book was published, and I'm happy to see, you know, we already in the second publishing, uh, second edition right. of publishing. And uh, the book has, the paperback version has been moved up to present. Uh, it was going to be next year, but it, because of the honor of the uh, National Book Award, they decided to move it up to now. So, All right. so I had shared with you earlier that uh, students in the incarceration and justice class that I'm teaching are reading um, your book. And um, I hope that some of them will ask some questions during the Q&A, but a few students also sent me some questions to ask you. Um, so one question is about how you feel um, opening yourself up um, for the world to read your story? Um, do you feel vulnerable? Do you feel a sense of freedom? Are you worried that people will read it and not care? All of the above. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, as I said, when I first started reading the book, or writing the book, rather, for, for the first couple of months, you know, uh, I've always prided myself in, in being very disciplined and being objective. And as I go back over the things I had written, I realized that I wasn't being totally honest and that I wasn't really dealing with some painful things in my life. I was kind of like just skim over. So I come to the conclusion, you need, you need to get somebody to help you to do this. And so uh, a woman named Leslie George, uh, who was, uh, who's a journalist and uh, a social activist, and she was a member of uh, the International Coalition of Free to Angola Tree. And so I talked with her and several other uh, professors. One is a law, teaches law, and one is a sociology professor. And, uh, uh, one is uh, Angela Bell, who's a law professor, and uh, uh, Rebecca Hensley, who's a sociology professor at South East Louisiana, and the others at Southern University. And uh, Les had, a, uh, you know, she started out as a journalist doing an interview with me, and she was so affected by what had happened to us. She eventually joined our coalition. And so she was there. She knows she went through so much with all three of us. And uh, so I decided I think she would be the, you know, the best person to help me because she knew the questions that had to be answered. Right. And she knew when I was not being totally honest. And before writing the book, you know, she asked me to give her some time to think about it. And so when she decided to do it, she said, under these conditions, you have to be totally honest, you know, because if this book is going to 
be able to raise the level of conscience, as you say, of the people who read it. You, they have to feel as though what they are reading is honest, and it comes from your heart, it comes from your soul. If you can promise me that, then I'll help you write the book. And a year later, in a thousand fights and arguments, <laughs> you know, uh, we're being rewarded with, with acknowledgement from the National Book Award, you know. Okay, I have one last question for you, and then we'll open it up to all of you. Um, this is, well, one of the first times I heard you speak, um, you said very simply, um, but profoundly, that you love being a human being. Um, and uh, I wanna, this was a poster that was made by one of the PNAP faculty who teaches at Stateville, Anna Martine Whitehead. I, I know you've seen it before. Um, yes. But uh, another student asked this question. Um, you know, what do you think, you know, where do you find hope? And what do you think there is to be hopeful about um, in our movement um, to end mass incarceration, to end solitary confinement? Well, my hope is, comes from my love of being a human being and humanity as a whole. Uh, in spite of ourselves, we somehow always seem to keep moving forward. We may take steps backwards or sideways, but some, somehow some individual or some event will occur and it will move us forward again. So that's, you know, as far as hope, uh, you know, hope is an abstract term, so it's kind of hard to define. At least for me, it's, it's abstract, you know, because hope means a lot of different things to people. And, uh, you know, I just always believe in humanity. I believe it, given the opportunity, if given the encouragement, if given the, uh, the, the, the knowledge and the wisdom, the experience that they will do the right thing eventually. And it can be frustrating at times. I'm deeply disappointed in what's going on in the country now. The fact that we have a president who has openly admitted that he's a white supremacist. And the pain and suffering that he, he inflicts on uh, uh, the people in this country and the world. And, but, you know, I have, you know, the hope and faith that eventually we will, we will, will straighten what he's doing out and move, begin to move forward again, you know. Right now, we're trapped in this vicious circle where we're going around and around and around. And uh, sooner or later, somebody's gonna fix, some young man or some young woman uh, is gonna figure out what we can do to break this cycle, and they're gonna find other young men and women who think and feel the same way, and they're gonna become together become a force, you know, I'm, I'm, I always say that uh, an individual can cause chaos, a mass movement can cause change. You know? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for questions from all of you. We have a microphone right here in the center of the room. If you can line up and we'll begin taking questions. Well, my name is Gary Levitt, L-E-A-D-I-T-T. I wish I could write a book, but all the forced writing assignments in school were not so helpful for me to do that. <laughs> the police in the Chicago area are really more like the Soviet Union and China than people might think. They always seem to be against me. A great book, talked about by Studs Schickel was Race Horse by a man who went through a Harrigan experience and uh, Letters to My Torturer by a man who spoke at Borders when it was near Clark and Diversity. And he, he, he got in trouble, he tried to get out of solitary, just to get out of solitary. And a nun who was tortured, oh, a horrible story. A great story according to Daniel Ellsberg. I heard Christian Gerhauer and Gerald Huber gave a masterful Mahler performance at, 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 at Mandel Hall, what a performance. And you also, you two have given a masterful performance. He recorded his Mahler, 
And uh, I, Christian Anandpour has a great show, Walter Isaacson and David McCulloch. What a masterful way of talking. If only Donald Trump would take after and his friends take after them. And you are an inspiration for all of us today and forever. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Woodbox. I wanted Hello. to first thank you for coming and speaking and sharing your story with us. Um, I study the long-term mental health impacts of solitary confinement and have been working with some survivors recently. And I wanted to ask um, if you feel comfortable talking about it and sharing, um, if you would talk a little bit about um, whether the, your time inside solitary continues to impact your mental health to this day. And if so, what are the things that help you to cope with that? Well, I never had a mental problem in the sense that, you know, I lost touch with reality. But I, I did develop claustrophobic uh, and uh, I still have claustrophobic attacks, you know, which was a surprise to me because I thought that once I was out of prison and I had more space to move around and stuff. But... Uh, and what I also learned was that claustrophobic attacks don't depend on being alone. Because the first one I remember having, uh, one, two of my nieces and nephews were in a swimming meet, and I was there with the whole family. And, you know, I could feel it coming on, you know. Uh, it's hard to put in the word, but it's like the very environment itself is compressing mm -hmm. down on you, and, and you're losing a sense of space. And so I just excused myself and, you know, went out and walked around the parking lot. And eventually, you know, uh, you know, the world got back to where it was and I went back in. Uh, I do at times, sometimes I wake up and I'm disillusioned. I, I'm not aware of where I'm at. And, I, you know, I see it doesn't last but seconds, but really I have no sense of the time, you know, but... Uh, uh, but, you know, it's been a pretty good while since I've had a claustrophobic attack. Mm -hmm. But uh, about a month ago, I woke up one morning and and was in a panic because I didn't recognize where I was at because I was always accustomed to waking up seeing bars, you know, prison bars and stuff, you know, or concrete walls and stuff. And, but, you know... I, I say seconds, you know, and then the reality snaps back in, and I'm like, oh, you're in the bedroom, you know. Mm -hmm. And But, yeah, I'm working or I have worked with, uh, there's a psychologist named Craig Haney. He is one of the experts on uh, the effects of solitary confinement. And uh, him and uh, a doctor named Bree Williams have did extensive research, and they have shown that Solitary confinement not only affects the mental and emotional thing, but it actually it causes a physical deterioration. And uh, so this is another reason not to uh, use solitary confinement uh, as a means of uh, housing people, you know. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Woodfox. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. My name is Brianna Payton. I'm a master's student at the School of Social Service Administration here. Um, and I wanted to um, ask you a little bit about um, earlier in your talk, if I can share kind of an honest reaction. It hurt me a little bit to hear you refer to yourself like earlier in your life as like I was just a petty criminal or I was just, you know, a petty th a thief or whatever. Um, because I feel like people use that kind of logic to um, inflict so much pain and suffering on people. Like, oh, this person is just a criminal or they're just that, this or that. Um, and I wanted to know if you could share a little bit more about like who you who you were like during that time, just as a person. And like I know that even when people commit crimes, they still have values and things they care about and people they care about. And if you could just like share a little bit about um, just who you were at that time in your life. Um, and my other question was just about whether um, your your survival of solitary confinement for so long strikes me as nothing short of a miracle. And I was just wondering if there was any role that like faith or spirituality played in your ability to endure um, that experience. Well, who was I at that time? I was, you know, I always say that particularly in today's time that uh, particularly African Americans have no idea the brutality of racism, because racism now 
has taken on a different form, a different expression. Everything is coded. But I come from an era when racism was was brutal and up in your face, and every every black person in America was referred to as nigger uh, without hesitation. You know, I can remember seeing news programs and stuff where, you know, blacks were the uh, news anchors used that time to describe incidents that had happened to black uh, people. You know. Uh, I use the term economic victim because the economic situation for African Americans in that time was virtually non existent. And so the options were you either became a bum or you became a petty criminal. And, you know, I, unfortunately, uh, in order for me, the, the biggest part of uh, the transformation for me was the acknowledging who I was and what I had did. And I tried to sugarcoat it, um, you know, not even though I knew that at some point I developed the, the intellect to understand the, the connection between the economic and, 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 and racism in this country, I played more of a part of me being what I was than who I was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I can't use that as an excuse. You know, uh, I have to, uh, or I had to, to own up to the pain and suffering that I inflicted in my own community and other people. And as I said earlier, that was one of my concerns. When I got out, would my people for forgive me? Would they accept me? And the qualities of humanity that I had developed, would they accept that? Would they let me, you know, try to atone for some of the things I had done, even though it wasn't my fault, the pain was still real. The things I did were still horrible. And uh, how would my being free all of a sudden, how would that affect my family? And I'm happy to say on both points, you know, uh, it turned out great, you know. Uh, I have a wonderful family and the support of them and, and, and the community. So uh, I guess, to simplify it, I was a young teenage black man in America, in racist America, trying to survive. I, you know, there's no saying if, if you can't, your desire is to survive in an honorable way. But if I can't survive in an honorable way, I will survive in whatever way I can. And so that's who I basically was. And the second question was whether there was any role that faith or spirituality played in your survival of solitary confinement. Well, that was, a, um, you know, I actually didn't come into the man I am now until I was in my early 40s. So it took 20 years, 20-something years. I was 22 years old when I was placed in prison. So it took that time for me to first self-educate myself. I had to... Uh, uh, Un uneducate myself from what I had been educated to, and then re-educate myself to being a better human being. You know, I mean, imagine my surprise uh, sitting in a prison cell and reading about the history and the contributions of African people to a civilization worldwide. You know, when I was going to school in the 60s, uh, we had no, and when we taught history, uh, you know, there were no black uh, figures or accomplishment or anything, you know. And so I think when, you know, over that period of time and steadily moving forward and steadily uh, uh, educating and re-educating myself and raising my level of consciousness and developing wisdom from every experience, you know, I... Uh, was able to uh, think, and I think there was a moment, uh, as I said earlier when we were talking about my mom, you know, uh, for, for a brief period of time, I had always thought that the biggest influence in my life were the great men and women throughout history I had read about. And I was sitting down one day, and I realized my mom 
was trying to teach me this. This is what she was trying to instill in me. This, this was the example. You know, she, she couldn't do it intellectually, but she did by examples. And, you know, uh, that eventually gave birth to her echoes. You know, uh, one day I was sitting in my cell and I was trying to figure out something, and I was really struggling with it. And I could hear my mom, you know, some of her, her wisdom, some of the things she would say to me. And everything, all of a sudden, it just cleared up. And I just got a, a pen and, and paper, and I wrote that poem, and I didn't have to change anything or go back or nothing. I just, it just flowed from, from my soul uh, to the paper uh, that I was writing on, you know. And it's one of my proudest moments, you know. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ilona Gersh. I'm with the Socialist Workers Party. And your commitment to humanity and building a social movement, both behind the bars and outside of the bars, reminded me a lot of the Cuban Five. I, yes. I see you're familiar. They, they wrote this book. Uh, it's the poor who face the savagery of the US, in quotes, justice system. And one of them in the introduction said, the jailers want to destroy you. They want to break your physical, moral, and mental integrity. You learn the first day that you have to resist this and that the measure of your victory in doing so will be to leave a prison, to leave prison a better person than when you walked in. Each of us, these are five Cuban revolutionaries yes. who were framed up by the US government and spend up to 16 years in prison in five separate parts of the US. They were released just before you were. Yes. And I, I, I can't help but think that the pressure uh, that brought your release also brought theirs, that it was part of an international campaign uh, to release. Without a doubt, prisoners. you know. Uh uh, the support, you know, and, and I at one time, you know, I, I have been a supporter of the Cuban Five, and uh, uh, and you know, I have sent, you know, uh, words of solidarity and stuff before they before they stop prison to prison communication, you know, uh, and uh, the Social Worker Party has really been a tremendous support of, uh, of myself and Harmony King. Uh, so thank you for that, you know. Thank you. All right. Too tall for this. Hello, Mr. Woodbox. Uh, Hello. My name is Srikant Christian. I'm actually one of Professor Kim's students. Really, thank you for coming in to talk to us. It means a lot to us. Um, I also wanted to return to the conversation on mental health. You discuss in several parts of your book, particularly the conversations you had with Dr. Craig Haney, you already also mentioned, but also yeah. Dr. Stuart Gracian as yes. well, several reflections on how you were feeling while you were in uh, incarceration. But you mentioned, and so what's so important to your narrative is that you left unbroken, that you managed to continue throughout this with the important and strong sense of self. But I did want to ask, what was it perhaps that you observed in other people who are going through similar things as you were? Um, one of the most haunting parts of your book for me was when you discuss the other incarcerated members who had, for example, been under chemical restraints under the proviso of prolixin and had been prolixin, used yeah. in the, uh, the treatment units, the TUs you talk about. So in your case, it's uh, exceptionally inspirational to all of us how you have surmounted what seems to be an impossibility to us, but would you mind reflecting a little bit more on what you saw in other prisoners who were subject to similar situations? Well, as I say, solitary, you know, every individual reacts to a situation differently, you know. I've seen men, as a matter of fact, there was a guy I was really, really close with, you know. Uh, uh, and I thought he was unbelievably strong. And I woke up one morning and he had hung himself, you know. So what you, you know, in prison, prisoners always try to, present a certain image to other prisoners because it's a matter of survival. And so I guess what I've, what I've observed is what you're seeing may not be exactly what it really is. 
you know, because I like I say, this this guy, I mean, I it took me about a year to stop grieving for this guy because I had so much respect for his strength. And, you know, whenever we had to protest something, he was always, you know, and it never dawned on me the pain and suffering that he was going through as a, as a result of being confined to a nine by six cell for 23 hours a day. Uh, and so it took me, it took really, it really affected me in, in a profound way. And it made me question a lot of things that I thought I had pretty much figured out and stuff, you know. And so I guess is, uh, excuse me, you know, I'm just thinking about it, it, it hurts, you know. Uh, I guess, you know, uh, it's believing in yourself first. That's where your belief had to start. It had to start with you. You have to believe that, you know, a guy, I remember when I got out and we had this meeting, and it was a lot of guys that knew me from prison. They came just because I was there with a vote meeting, and they wanted to say hello, and, you know, and there was one guy, his name was Clovis, and I noticed he was always standing off and stuff, you know. And so I finally, when I got a break, I went up to him, and I'm like, you know, what's wrong, Clovis? You know, I knew him from Ann Cole, and he said, man, you know, uh, I don't belong here. And I'm like, why, you know? He said, well, everybody here, I, and I just sit there, I say, look, until you start believing that wherever you're at, you have a right to be there, you're never going to feel like you belong there, you know? You have a right, as, as much right as every man and woman that's sitting in this meeting, and that. they had about 50 of us, you know? You have a right. You have a right to be here, you know? So there was a part of the... Uh, you know, after we got to discussing whatever it was, everybody gave an impression. And when it got to him, he stood up. He said, I just want to see I have a right to be him, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, those are the small jewels uh, that you get out of life, you know, uh, when you're struggling to try to achieve something, to raise. You know, my goal is always to raise the level of consciousness of the, the next man or woman or child that, you know, I'm around, you know, to teach it, you know, to teach them that, you know, stay strong, stay focused, be willing to sacrifice, be willing to compromise, never get discouraged, you know. And if you continue down that way, eventually you will, you know, and I, you know, I look at social struggle like this. I don't see an end. My responsibility is to teach the torch of social struggle and carry it in a manner that is dignified and honest so that when the ancestors say, okay, it's time to come home. So when I hand that torch over to the next man or woman or child, it will be a torch that they can be proud to, to accept from me. So, you know, that's pretty much how I'm trying to live my life. You know? I think that we have time for just one more question. Um, so I invite the other two who are standing to join uh, Albert Woodfox um, when he's signing books. But I know that you have been waiting for a while. So please, you'll be the final question. OK, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Woodfox, for your courage, for your strength, for your inspiration. Uh, I guess uh, more so what I have is a comment. Um, I. Uh, I learned about your story about the, the, the torture and the, the issues at Angola State Penitentiary maybe about 25 years ago when I was uh, in elementary school. Um, and I just thought about, uh, I'd say 110 years ago, my great grandmother lived in Angola, Louisiana. Okay. Before she moved to Chicago. And on the other side of my family, uh, my seven times great-grandmother uh, was on the ship that landed in Colonial Virginia in 1619. And so Angola had so many meanings for me. Uh, I would even go and learning of your story, wanting to go to Angola, Louisiana. I have not been there, but I 
wound up living and working in Congo and in Angola, uh, in Central Africa. Okay. Uh, and all of that was so inspiring for me. You mentioned learning history and all of these things. I uh, spent a great deal of years, about eight years, here in Chicago as a professor of Africana Studies at Malcolm X College. And it just really, uh, your story, so many stories, so many stories like yours uh, are really inspiring. And as I think about what you said of passing the torch from the ancestors, I just thank you for uh, being that torch bearer for so many of us. My name is Dr. Edward Davis, and I uh, just thank you for your, thank you, Dr. your story. Thank yeah. you. I've known this guy 30 years. I'm not going to cut him off. I'm not to make a speech. I just want to say, Albert, on behalf of all the people like myself that had been tortured, that had been suffering sol solitary isolation, confinement, and many other kind of torture, I would like to thank you for being so courage, for being so strong to tell your story, to educate people, to tell them about what has been your experience as many other people around in the world. And here in Chicago, a number of people that are already free, but they were for many years incarcerated and they were tortured by the police here in Chicago. And I think what you are saying is so important for every one of us and for the whole world, and especially here for the people in Chicago. So they know what has happened here and they know your experience, I really would like to thank you for being here, for telling us your experience, your story, because it's so valuable for everyone to hear about this. Because when people leave this room, they cannot be the same. When they leave this room, cross that door, they are going to be different people, different person, because they are going to struggle. They are going to fight to once forever, the solitary confinement has to be ended and brutality and torture has to be stopped. Thank you so much for that. I want to give a shout out to Mario Venegas from the Illinois Coalition Against Torture for his close, great closing remarks. And from the bottom of our hearts, thank Albert Woodfox for sharing his story and his humanity and for Alice Kim doing such a wonderful dialogue and interview. Um, I have one last thing to say about the Kirshner family, which is that they love good food. And we have a reception out in the lobby from, and it's not just your usual chunks of cheese. It's from Piccolo Mondo. There's empanadas. You're all invited. And Albert will be signing books. Um, the Semcoop, I hope, has brought enough books for all the people who want them. And I want to thank the Posen Center staff and iHouse and everybody who's contributed to this wonderful program this evening. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Albert. You've really changed all of us. Thank you.